Hello, my name is Sally Krell and I am the Director of Adaptive Recreation and Inclusion at Reach for Resources. And I'm Brianna Max, the Assistant Director of Adaptive Recreation and Inclusion at Reach for Resources. We are making this video in partnership with Hennepin County through the Voter Outreach and Engagement Grant to spread awareness on voter registration and accessible voting options here in Minnesota. Going forward, we might talk about some terms you may not have heard before. So we just wanna give you some brief definitions of those terms. So the first term that you might hear is the electoral college. The electoral college is the group of individuals who officially vote for the president and vice president of the United States. Each state has an assigned number of electors based on their population size. These electors are expected to vote the same way as the popular vote in their state. Um, 48 states have a winner takes all approach. The only states that don't are Nebraska and Maine. And that means they must vote in the same way that the popular vote went. We'll also touch on ballots, which is the piece of paper that is used to record someone's vote, whether you're doing it at the polling place or at home. We'll also talk about polling places or precincts, a building where voting takes place during an election. And it might be one that often has a different function, like a school or a different building. Each person has a designated polling place or precinct, so make sure you research where yours is before day of voting. We will also touch on absentee voting or ballots, which is a system of voting in which voters who are unable to be present at the polls complete their ballots and typically submit them by mail in advance of an election. We'll go into more detail on how to request that ballot in that process later on in this video. Thank you. Your right to vote is important. On our agenda today, we'll talk about why voting is important, how to get registered to vote, how to get informed about what will be on your ballot in the fall, what to expect at the polls, like how to vote and what accessibility options you have, and then we'll invite you to check out our playlist of other important voter information. The first thing we want to touch on is why voting is so important and why it is important that every eligible person gets out and votes on election day. Well, sometimes it feels like we always just hear how important it is to vote during presidential elections every four years. It is important to also make sure that we vote in city and state elections. In a National Geographic article, it was stated that 15% of voters turned up for elections like mayor, city council, school board, judges, and police chiefs. This means that only 15% of the population has been having a say in who is running their city. These positions may not seem as important, but they are the individuals making decisions on city laws and policies, judicial system changes, changes in your school board or school district, and many more issues that affect our day-to-day -day lives. If we look at a past presidential election to show how important voting is and how every vote does make a difference, in 2000, George W. Bush won the state of Florida by only 537 votes, which seems kind of like a big number, but really isn't in the grand scheme of how many people are voting. So if only 600 more voters had come out to vote or had voted a different way, the outcome may have been different. This really comes into play with the Electoral College, because as we said before, most states have a winner-takes-all policy for the votes that electors are casting. So if your vote is that deciding factor for the Electoral College to make it into a majority, then your vote could be the reason someone gets elected. If we look specifically at trends in the disability community. In 2016, 56% of people with disabilities voted for the presidential election. In 2020, that number rose to 62% which is amazing and it is so important that we keep raising that number to try to get to 100% to make sure that all voices are being heard, not just the majority. Now let's talk about how you get registered to vote. You must register before you can vote. You can always check your registration at mnvotes.org to see if you're already registered. And if you're not, there are a couple of ways to get registered. You can always pre-register online or via a paper copy in the mail. 
or you can register day of at the polls. Registering online to vote can be easy. Just head to mnvotes.org and click register online and follow these five steps. First one, eligibility. Second step, identity verification. The third step, adding in your address. This is also one of the places that you can use to request an absentee ballot. The fourth step is reviewing your information and fifth, signing and submitting. Just a note for online registration. You do need to have an email. If you don't have an email or access to an email, you can always download a paper copy of the registration form that you'll later submit to your local elections office. Step one, eligibility. Are you a US citizen and are you going to be 18 years or older before the election date this year? If so, you are eligible to vote. All people, including those with disabilities, are eligible to vote unless a judge has specifically said that you are no longer eligible to vote. In step two, you'll put in your name, ID number, and contact information. Start by entering your full name in the first boxes, then by entering your date of birth. Next, it'll ask for an ID number from either a state-issued ID or driver's license. Please note that if you do not have one of those items, you can also use the last four digits of your social security number instead. After that, you'll put in your contact information. Again, as a reminder, you do need an email to register to vote online. In step three, you'll enter the address where you live. If you have other questions about where you're living and how that works for voting, you can check out the yellow panel on the side for any questions you may have. Otherwise, this is where you'll enter your zip code so you make sure that you're voting in the right spot. In step four, you'll review all of the information you've put in up until this point. It'll show it in a list format below this message. And finally, in step five, you'll complete your registration by signing and submitting this form. Just check the box to acknowledge and type in your name to sign digitally. Now you're registered to vote. If you are unable to pre-register or miss the October 15th deadline to pre-register online, you can register day of and you're still able to vote. You'll just need to register when you arrive at your polling place and it may make your wait time or your time at the polls be a little bit longer. If you do plan to register day of, there are some additional things you'll need to bring with you when you go to vote. You'll need to bring an ID with your current name and address on it or a photo ID and a document to confirm your name and current address. So the ID that you bring can be expired and it can be something like a driver's license, a state ID, your passport, a military ID, tribal ID, or a veteran's ID. You can also use a college or high school ID. If you are planning to bring just a picture ID that doesn't have your address on it, you'll also need to be sure you bring a document to confirm your address, and that can be something like a phone, internet, TV, or utility bill, a bank statement or credit card statement that has your address, or lease or um, rent agreement or your mortgage documents. Um, you also can bring with a registered voter from your precinct who can confirm your address. So if you have a roommate who's already registered or just anyone else who lives in your neighborhood who can confirm you live where you say you are. If you live in a group home or another group living situation, someone who works at your living place can confirm and vouch for you that you live there. They can also do this for multiple people. So if there's a whole group of individuals from your living facility who are planning to vote at the same time, one staff member can go and vouch for all of them. Now that you're either registered online or planning to register when you get out to the polls, let's get informed and figure out what are we gonna see on our ballots this year? 
on Ballotopedia, you can select look up your sample ballot and enter in the address at which you're registered to view what your ballot might look like this upcoming election season. Here's an example of what your sample ballot might look like on Ballotpedia. You might see ballot measures, federal elections, state elections, and local elections. Under each of these items, you can click the down arrow to view all of the candidates listed for each of these spots. You then will want to get informed by learning more about each of the candidates so you can make an informed decision. Some great places to look for research are ballotpedia.org, usa.gov backslash voter research, vote411.org, and votesmart.org. Now that we have talked about how to register to vote and how to become an informed voter to vote, make sure you're voting for the candidates who most align with your views or beliefs, we're going to talk about what to expect when you arrive at the polls on election day. So first thing you want to do is make sure you plan what time works best for you and your schedule to go vote at the polls. Most polling places are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., but definitely check and make sure that your local polling place follows those same hours. Planning a time that fits your schedule, but also when you're gonna feel the most comfortable is very important. Polling places can get very, very busy on election day, and so please expect to wait. If that waiting time is hard for you, maybe explore some of the accessibility options that we're gonna talk about in the next couple of slides. Also, polling places are typically the busiest before or after the kind of regular nine to five work day. So if you want it to be a little less busy, maybe trying to go mid morning or mid afternoon, kind of avoiding those end, of st end or start times of work and the lunch hour. Once you arrive at the polling place, if you are already registered to vote, you will just need to find your name on the list and then sign next to it that you are there to vote. If you are registered, you should not need to show your ID when you sign in. You should just be able to sign by your name. If you are not already registered, this is where you would register and show up and all the documentation that you brought to be prepared. Once you're done waiting and it is your time to vote, you will vote in a private area and your vote is secret. You will vote with pen or pencil and make sure to completely fill in the oval next to your choice. You can also fill out your ballot using a ballot marking machine. There are many options for marking your ballot and for those accessible options, such as large print, audio instructions, keypads, or touch screens. We'll dive more into those accessible options in the next slide. Make sure to read your ballot carefully. The ballot instructions will say how many candidates you can vote for for each office. It will typically say to choose one, but some local offices have more than one seat to fill, so you might be picking two or three from the available list of candidates. Your ballot will still count even if you do not vote for every race or ballot question. So if there's something you don't feel comfortable voting for or you are unsure how you want to vote, you can skip questions and the rest of your votes still count. If you make a mistake on your ballot, so if you're using a pen and you accidentally fill in the wrong person or realize that you were off a question or something, you do have the right to ask for a replacement ballot, so you'll just need to flag down an election official and they can help you with that. There are some things that you cannot do at a polling place or while voting. The biggest one of these is you cannot display any campaign t-shirts, buttons, literature, or other materials which relate to specific candidates, official political parties, or ballot questions on the ballot for that day. So you cannot wear a shirt that is supporting one candidate or a certain political party. If you do wear something like that to the polls, you will either need to cover it up or remove that item while you are in the polling place. You also may not place pre-printed stickers on your ballot in the write-in space. So it, don't bring any stickers to help with accessibility check in with your polling place and see what options they have for you that can help mitigate those challenges. 
You also are not allowed to take a photo of your ballot. You can take a photo when you leave the polling place with your I voted sticker, but you cannot take it of your actual ballot. <clears throat> While there are those specific things that you cannot do at the polling place, there are some things that you should know is your right. So your right to vote. Um, you have a right to vote if you are in line anytime before 8 p.m. So say you decide to go vote later in the evening and you get in line at 745 and are still waiting when the polls close at 8 p.m., you still will be allowed to vote. So just keep waiting until it's your turn, even if it is after that 8 p.m. time. You have a right to take time off of work to vote without losing your pay, personal leave, or vacation times. If you have any concerns with this, definitely talk with your employer um, and they will help make sure you're following all of their protocols and getting that time allowed to go and vote. Um, you have the right to orally confirm who you are and to ask another person to sign for you if you cannot sign your name. So if you're pre-registered to vote and you go tell them your name and then you're supposed to sign next to it, confirming that you are yourself and you're going to vote, you can say verbally what your name is and have someone else sign for you if you're unable to sign your name. You also have the right to ask anyone for help while you are voting. So if you require assistance by in marking your ballot for any reason, um, you can be given assistance by someone of your choice. So it doesn't need to be an election official. It can be anyone who you choose to help except for your boss or if you are a part of a union, someone who oversees your union. So it needs to make sure it's a non-biased person, but it can be pretty much anyone of your choosing. You also just in general have the right to vote, even if you are under guardianship. So if someone else is your legal guardian, you still can vote unless a judge has revoked your right to vote, which you would know ahead of time. You also have the right to take a sample ballot into the voting booth with you. So in the resources that we had just showed about getting informed, there are some where you can print a sample, ba a sample ballot. So you're able to practice filling in the dots and then to remember the research that you did. You can bring any of those materials in with you to the voting station, but make sure you're not trying to submit that sample ballot instead of your regular one. Now looking specifically at the types of adapted equipment or modified voting methods that they have available to you at the polls, it is really important to understand what options you have so you know what to ask for. Just taking an overview of why these types of equipment are so important is if we look at that previous example of the disability commuter, community voter turnout, in 2016 versus 2020, that increase in voter turnout is largely credited to the increased accessibility of voting options or voting by mail. States that made it easier to vote via mail had a higher percentage of voters with disabilities and voters in general who showed up to vote. Minnesota is one of the states that made these things easier and in turn saw our voting numbers rise. And we are actually a leader in the nation in voter turnout year after year, not just looking at one specific year. So diving into the specific equipment that is on your slides, um, this is a very brief overview, but you can learn more about each specific piece of equipment in videos and on our YouTube playlist. So once you find out which type of equipment you have at your polling place, then you can go watch a video on how to use it properly. The staff of the polling place should also be trained and able to help you with that. So the four machines that are included on this slide are the four that are most typically used in Minnesota. Hennepin County uses the Omni ballot tablet the most, but definitely check what your precinct has available, um, especially if you live in a county other than Hennepin County. So while each machine may have its own features and work a little bit differently, all of the ballot marking machines used in Minnesota 
do have specific functions that they have to be able to do. So they will allow selections by touching the screen if it has a touch screen or pressing braille keys on the keypad. It will read the ballot to you through headphones while you mark the ballot either with a pen or on the tablet or with a braille keypad. That way, if you have any struggles with reading or reading comprehension, you can have it read to you. It will also allow you to turn the screen off for privacy. So if you need to call someone in for help or need any assistance during the process, you can still keep your ballot a secret. And then it will also warn you about ballot marking errors. So if you vote for more than one party or more than one person for the same um, position or same um, yeah, position, um, it will let you know that you've done that. Or if you're missing someone who you didn't vote for, things like that. So you'll catch those errors e more easily. And then we'll also print your choices onto the ballot. So you're still voting the same type of way as everyone else with a ballot that gets submitted, but it just will help make it a little bit easier to fill out that ballot. If you're not comfortable or you're not able to get to your polling place on the day of the election, there are other ways to vote. Aside from assistive technology, you can also vote without entering your polling place. You can vote absentee at home or early absentee voting or early voting in the 46 days before an election. You can also use curbside voting if you're not able to make it inside your polling place on the day of the election. For curbside voting on the day of the election, you can request that a ballot be brought to you during the election hours at your polling place. Two representatives, one from each major party, will bring your ballot to you and then submit your ballot for you once you've finished. Research your specific polling place for more information on how to request curbside voting. In the 46 days before an election, all voters have at least one location where they can vote early in person with an absentee ballot. View the list of voting locations before election day on mnvotes.org for upcoming elections or contact your county election office. To request an absentee ballot, you'll request it online or you can print off a copy of your request form to mail in your request. The earlier you do this, the better. To ensure that you have ample time to receive your ballot, make your choices, and mail it back in. If you are, think you're going to be unable to get it mailed in by election day, you can always bring your ballot to a designated drop box by 8 p.m. on the day of the election. Please do not bring your ballot to a polling place. If you're using absentee at home, you'll also need a witness to sign the envelope of your ballot. This can either be someone who's a registered voter or a notary. If you have any questions about the other options and other ways to vote, you can check out mnvotes.org for more information.